and in this session actually we would like to welcome our one of the guest speakers dr faiza hasnat uh, dr faiza hasnat is a professor from english department university of florida orlando she is author academic and translator she was born in bangladesh her fiction non fiction and translation works are nationally and internationally published in numerous journals and anthologies her debut short story collection the bird catcher and other stories which was published in 2018 was simultaneously published from the us and bangladesh her academic books and translation works have been published by renowned publishers both at home and abroad her most notable translation works are no faizunnesses rubjalal which was published from the bill publishers in 2009 nilima ibrahim's ami dirangona bolchi she actually translated that one our heroine i speak from bangla academy 2017 the translation of the charja pods and begum sufia kamal's the diary of 1971 both upcoming from the bangla academy she teaches literature in the english department of the university of central florida in orlando where she lives with her family her paper is of about knowing being writing the task as a woman so now i would like to call dr faiza hasna to uh start her session her speech thank you uh, thank you shafin can you guys hear me yes can absolutely you hear me? fine okay okay thank you shafin that was a uh, uh, a great introduction and i'm i'm humbled by that and i would like to thank everyone uh, of this uh, uh conference organizers and uh it's a pleasure being here and i've been uh, listening to a good number of uh, papers and great presenters um uh, what i'm going to do is actually it's uh, you will see it's, it's it's a it's not a uh, uh organized synchronized logically you know motivated um presentation of argument that would follow the you know androcentric phylogocentric uh, ideology of of uh, theory uh, epistemology ontology and writing so um knowing being writing the task as a woman i tried to look into into the whole uh, uh not ideology the whole uh you know the the identity the the aspiration inspiration dream uh existence the phenomena you know all the all the all the phenomena that goes around this this category you know women or women or or genders or in lgbtq a plus the whole um, the whole concept how do we how do we think how do we read how do we study how do we be you know uh, and become the being the woman and the, the the knowledge of you know woman being a woman how is that the epistemology of of femininity you know womanhood how does that work and when you connect that epistemology to the ontology of being where 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 does the framework you know interconnect and then when the writer the woman writer is writing or a non binary gender writer is writing how do how do they you know uh, uh confront or reconfigure or represent you know the the, the identity uh, uh so that was kind of my my uh, periphery uh from that perspective i am just trying to give some ideas uh but before i do that uh, i want to thank uh, ankit right the first uh, speaker of in the morning session and i i don't uh, i don't know uh, their person you know preferred pronoun so Ankit uh, did a wonderful presentation it was insightful and and I'm glad that I'm going after their presentation because uh, that that aspect of you know gender or gendered and sexed body uh, thinking being writing so all those things uh, you know for me it's not making sense you know in in that sense and the the, the technical session the doctor Sadaf ran 
it was also very insightful in the sense that it gave literary representations and then uh, Firdaus from Yemen, she also gave this idea of, you know, womanhood in context of taking care of the physical body, you know, um, the medical doctor or teacher, the two things that you have to take care of, the physical, you know, ontology, the, the being of a woman, that body should be seen by a female doctor, and then the teacher that she should teach, you know, the only job, the good job that she can do is teach her community, her children, you know. Uh, so that was also um, quite insightful. Uh, I hope you will uh, enjoy what I have. I, I hope you will have more questions than I might give you some answers. So um, bear with me. Can you see my uh, screen? Shafin, can you see my screen? No, can, not yet. No? Okay, so let me share it. Oh, I'm sorry, give me a second. I thought I had it in my power. I think now you can see it. Yes, it's coming. Okay. Yeah. All right. So knowing being writing the task as a woman. Being a woman is an unending task by its own right. A woman's knowledge is what Simone de Beauvoir calls the experience for Q or lived experience. The manifold patriarchal narratives of a woman's subject position as an other makes it difficult for her to claim her consciousness and distorts her, under, uh, her understanding of the self. A woman's knowledge comes from her experiences as a lived body in a specific context that is constituted by the facticity of her socio-political historical environment. Her ontological desire to construct her identity is dependent on that facticity and her writing makes it possible for her to enact her knowing and her being. Her knowledge and her meaning as a woman is dependent on her ability to reconstitute and reconfigure her identity as a lived body, a body in situation. Uh, this paper does not intend to offer a definitive assertion on the knowing and being of a woman. I will uh, bring more questions than answers and I will leave the platform open and indeterminate. What I have here is more of a rupture and dissonance than a cohesive statement of absolute affirmation. For I consider such avowals to be detrimental to the ongoing process of a woman's identity as a subject in action, as a conscious learning subject. And as, as a conscious learning subject, I value the process and context of knowing over the justification or the end product. Therefore, I do not intend to impose my privilege locus as an abstract universal justification of knowledge. I will only unravel the process and context of knowing and present the endless possibilities of agencies therein. I'll give uh, my own understanding of feminist epistemologies in the format of a brief overview. I'll explore the ontology of womanness or, or being of a woman. Uh, Dr. Faiza, uh, we are not actually hearing you. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, so can you hear me now? Yes, um, oh. but uh, I think you have shared uh, another, uh, yeah, now it's fine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, sorry, I don't know how far I was, but I'll keep on going. So I'll give my under own understanding of feminist epistemologies in a format of a brief overview. 
I'll explore the ontology of womanness or being of a woman and the identity formation of woman as a knower and a knowing subject. I will also focus on women's discourse language in an attempt to locate the writing speaking woman as a subject in action. As I expound on these issues, I'll take an attempt to propose a specific critical platform to be more relevant and productive in context of gender studies in South Asia. As an academic creative writer and translator of women's text, I'm always invested into pulling out references from literary texts, a habit which I will uh, uh, forfeit here. What I'll do instead is that at the end of this paper, I'll mention three legendary women from the Indian subcontinent as my metaphors or signifiers of women's trajectories as a knowing, existing, writing subject. And finally, I'll deliver a concluding remark that will somehow reflect my identity as a creative writer. So uh, this my first section is feminist epistemology. So the knowing as a woman. Historically speaking, the category woman is a marginalized object and subject of knowledge. Since the field of epistemology proper is thoroughly androcentric, women's ways of knowing or women's knowledge its production and validation have always been a contesting ground. Feminist epistemology calls into question the privileging of gender as a center of construction and enforcement of knowledge and knowing, and criticizes the inherent polit politics of, uh, of and in gender knowledge. In an attempt to liberate thought and knowledge from gender trap, feminist critics proposed a new perspective to the process of knowing that is all inclusive and encompasses diverse feminisms beyond borders of cultures, races, ethnicities, and genders. Feminist epistemology is it's, it's a fluid plurality of, of the understanding and exploration of knowledge that is gathered not from individual evidence and perception, but from collective evidences of peoples. By questioning the validity of the privileging of abstract universal knowledge and its justification of privilege and focus, uh, uh, justification and focusing instead on the process and context of practical, social and localized knowledges and feminist epistemologies, they pursue an understanding of the impact of the social status as well as the sex body of the knower upon the production of knowledge. Sandra Harding, uh, She's a renowned uh, epistemologist, and she wrote um, this book called Feminism and Methodology. And uh, this chart that I have here, it's based on her book. And in that book, she, she uh, explores feminist epistem epistemologies in three uh, categories, feminist empiricism, feminist standpoint, and feminist postmodernism. Feminist empiricism, is, it's, it identifies gendercentrism in the treatment of women and gender. It locates gender bias and sexism as the obstacles in the theory of knowledge and advocates for detection of androcentric biases and inclusion of women researchers in every field of knowledge. It demands a modification of traditional empiricism, asking for a method that is based on contextual empiricism that includes multiculturalism, race, and gender diversities within the areas of science and social science and society as a whole. Uh, the second category, feminist standpoint theory, it focuses on the social context of the knower researcher by combining Marxism and uh, object relation theory. Knowledge is never neutral. It is achieved di uh, differently through different methods and from various locations, contexts, and experience of the knower. Knowledge is therefore grounded on the lived experience of the knower. Uh, lived realities of women produce a unique standpoint that uh, the androcentric empiricism cannot capture or does not include. A person's lived experience as a cisgendered woman or non-binary LGBTQ plus A situate them in or outside a locus that produces knowledge in relation to their social, cultural, racial occasions and realities. Knowledge is learned and earned based on experience and social realities and struggles against oppression. It is uh, multiple standpoints taken by and from the marginalized viewpoints and experiences and location. 
questioning and exploring the privileged class or privileging any class or group for that matter. The third group, feminist postmodernist epistemology, it is Foucauldian in nature. That means it combines in it the two above mentioned branches. The shifting position of a knower, both as a subject and an object of knowledge, makes knowledge not a reversal or flipping of privileged position. It is a challenge of and a denunciation to any such role reversals and a replacement of one privileged position of a male knower with another non-male uh, knower. So it is a uh, Foucauldian deconstructionist, you know, post-structuralist uh, uh, method. So feminist epistemologies embody and expand through global, post-colonial, and transnational platform, including in it uh, its vast and ever-growing branches of interdisciplinary feminist areas of LGBTQA plus studies, races and ethnicities, visual arts and music, disability and impairment studies, multicultural studies, along with its regular interests in the fields of natural and social sciences. Instead of essentializing knowledge in the name of privilege, the women, not women, it's like plural always. So the women's epistemologies offer uh, knowers lived experience as a lived body in a social, political, historical context and opens the horizon of knowledge. Uh, uh, the second part is when with, uh, the ontology of the lived body comes in. The idea of woman's knowledge and existence as a culmination and exploration of lived experience is derived from none other than uh, Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, the identities that define us as feminine, as Beauvoir notes in The Second Sex, are, I quote, in incidental and inessential, a referential otherness, end quote. The lived body that experiences life in a specific socio-cultural historical context is able to attain and retain and deliver knowledge from an unbiased standpoint. Following Beauvoir's footprint, Toril Moy uh, remarks in her essay titled What is a Woman? that, I, I quote, to claim that the body is a situation is to acknowledge that the meaning of a woman's body is bound up with the way she uses her freedom. End quote. Using Toril Moy and Simone de Beauvoir, Iris Marison and Marion Young calls the lived body a body in situation, using the term situation from an existentialist viewpoint in which situation denotes the produce of facticity and freedom. And she says that the person always faces the material facts of her body and its relation to a given environment which constitute which constitutes her facticity, I mean, her, you know, uh, the fact of her life, her being, her reality, uh, and prepares her to use her ontological freedom to construct herself in relation to, the, to that facticity, her own reality, that is. In doing so, Young argues, a person refuses to stay passively grouped under a gendered structure and thus can transgress the normative heterosexual impositions, sexual division of labor, and other structural constraints and systemic discriminations. Oops, I'm still here, okay. Uh, we all know through Beauvoir that gendered identity is a social and historical construct, and through Butler, that this social construct is performatively uh, constituted. Gender, as Butler notes, is an expression of being, but that, sorry, uh, gender, is not an expression of being, but that of doing. And the repetitive acts of gender has the effect of producing, not representing a gender identity. Women's identities therefore have been constructed within the sex bodies through gendered performativity. Definition, uh, defining the identity of a body that is defined and differentiated as an object other of the absolute subject self should neither be the goal or the focus of feminism, according to Butler. Feminists should tr not try to define women in a structured normative term, Butler says. If anything, women should be seen as, I quote, a term in process, a becoming, a constructing that cannot rightfully be said to originate or end, which is open to intervention and resignification, end quote. 
and feminists should ask, again Butler, what new shape of politics emerges when identity as a common ground no longer constrains the discourse of feminist politics, end quote. In other words, one identity politics of essentialism should not be replaced with another such essential framing. The being of a woman is an open-ended term, always in the process of making and being. Since identity is formed in relation to power and systems of knowledge and representations, interpersonal and intersectional relations, local, global, racial, and postcolonial histories, a woman's and woman know, sorry, a woman knower's knowledge, that is, the epistemological expressions are interdependent on her ontological existence. So uh, the, the epistemological being is, is a, it, it cannot work without the ontological uh, understanding of the lived body. So the lived experience, which is the epistemological uh, ground also framework depends or coexist or uh, reciprocate uh, uh, the lived body's uh, you know, um, experiences. So in her essay titled Identities, Nadine Ehlers describes this shift of feminist focus from epistemology to ontology as a move from the critique of how things are known through uh, language, discourse, knowledge systems to the study of what is of that which exists outside of language, discourse, and knowledge systems. That which exists outside of language and knowledge systems is the ontology of the lived body of women, the body that lives, enacts, and reacts to the discourse and the semiotics of systemic uh, suppressions and violence by voicing her experience, not as a subjected other, but as a subject in action, a knower, who is forever engaged in the process of knowing and becoming a consciousness of difference of its otherness. Needless to say, this difference is a trajectory of truths about women and their multifarious interpretations, interrogations, and representations of their lived experience. Uh, women's writing, when you think about uh, epistemological inquiries, and you know, and, and connect it with their ontological being. So women's epistemological inquiries reflect the difference as knower, and and their ontological inquest denote uh, their existence as the lived body that is different from the knowledge produced and regulated about them by the endocentric discourse. Then it is it is obvious or it is uh, logical that women's writing and creative expressions they should also have, uh, should constitute the same difference. And, and this is what um, Irigaray and Helen Siksu uh, um, talk about when they, uh, they bring the discourse or you know, women's writing of the kind, uh, the, the original uh, you know, individual style of writing that is not following the master narrative you know, or the philogocentric fellow, ideology that has been going on. Uh, so in, in the preface to Sexes and Genealogies, Lucy Rigorai writes that, and I quote, Today it is all too clear that there is no equality of wealth and claims of equal rights to culture have blown up in our faces and that any woman who is seeking equality, with whom, with what, needs to give these problems serious consideration. It is understandable that women should wish for equal pay, equal career opportunities, but what is the real goal? End quote. The real goal, of course, according to Irigaray, is identity. And I quote again from Irigaray, salaries and social recognition have to be negotiated on the basis of identity, not equality. Without women, there is no society. Women have to proclaim this message loud and clear and demand a justice that fits their identity instead of some temporary rights befitting justice for men. End quote. According to Irigaray, seeing, uh, seeing is the place of privilege for the Western culture or for any fellow centric culture for that matter. The Freudian lacking and the Lacanian absence of phallus in women present her as a problem in the systematics of representation and desire. What cannot be seen has to be excluded, rejected from a scene of representation, Irigaray says. This problem of visual impairment is not a woman's burden to bear. 
The problem is with the system of representation that focuses on sight and makes women objects and, all, and also non-binary uh, people, objects of androcentric appropriative gazes. A woman, says Irigaray, cannot produce a cohesive mirror image of the phallocentric knowledge simply because women are not single in it. If mirroring matters in the representation of identity, then she is a speculum, a concave mirror. She's always knowing, always becoming, and always more than one. The Western phallocentric mirror image as the signifier of cohesive and ultimate knowledge has to be distorted and the paradigm of knowledge and representation has to be rewritten. Women need to develop a linguistic system to convey their multiplicity and difference and should create an alternative modes of representation and should rewrite symbolic order in such a way that it would allow women a space to speak from and which would also permit women to hear their own speech. Irigaray calls this polyform, a phrase that Ruth Robbins translates in her literary feminism as speaking woman, speaking about woman, and woman speaking to women. Irigaray's polyform is a sister concept of Sixu's creature feminine, as they both refuse the logos of the self-same of the androcentric discourse. They both refuse to I'm sorry, they both refuse to um, uh, talk straight, denouncing the logical stability regulated by the phallocentric modes of writing in the name of normative coherence. For Irigara and Sixu, sameness, similarity, and logical coherence, they do not have to be modes of writing. It is not similarity, but the contiguity that makes connection and logical sense plausible. It is not seeing that makes knowledge uh, possible. It is it is the words. It is hearing the words. Uh, poly, uh, poly uh, feminine and equature feminine are not specific methods and do not follow logically established structure, but they are a deconstructive in approach. But the fluid indeterminate, indeterminate contiguity of connection between with, for, and within women and their writings tend to go beyond deconstruction. So uh, thinking about, you know, this idea of epistemological, ontological uh, uh, discourse and putting in, in South Asian context, I was, uh, uh, I was thinking in context of, of, of the, the, the feminist like standpoint theory, uh, it, it kind of relates to what uh, Ankit said when Ankit was talking about what made them you know, uh, focal and, and Ankit said that uh, activism is not something happens, it, it calls you, you know. So that means there, uh, Ankit took a stand and there, that is the social context where uh, Ankit, uh, Ankit's uh, uh, epistemological understanding of genders connected with their understanding of their uh, ontological being as a non-binary you know, gender as someone who who does not follow the, you know, heteronormative uh, societal uh, uh, discourse. So uh, in that context, using like from a South Asian context, uh, I was, this This is what I, I propose, so to say, uh, because androcentric epistemic privilege is an oppressive authorial power in South Asian countries, Feminist standpoint theories can provide effective methods for South Asian feminisms to address the issues of gendered oppression and, and counteract or limit such oppressions. Anglo-American feminism focuses on women's epistemology on the basis of lived experience, while French feminism interprets the lived experience from the perspectives of psychoanalysis and post-structuralism. In her article on feminist standpoint, Kristen Entman agrees with Alison Wiley and Susan Harding as she says that, I quote, feminist standpoint requires a commitment to a particular social and political aims of inquiry, namely a commitment to understand and challenge systems of oppression and involves revealing the ways in which gender, race, class, 
sexuality, ability, and colonization have shaped and influenced objects of investigation." End quote. Feminist standpoint theories aim at producing knowledge for the marginalized groups with uh, an intent to challenge and counteract the oppressive ways that limit the well-being of the marginalized and restricts their ability to participate in the production of knowledge. It is not equal rights that women ought to fight for. It is the right to think, to be, and to express themselves. And I, I should say, it is not the equal rights that people ought to fight for. You know? It is the right to think, to be, and to express themselves. By inserting themselves into the androcentric center as a thinkers and knowers of equal level, and thus by becoming pseudo men with equal rights, women can only become a replica, a reflection, and not a corporeal and ontological entity on their own right. Exploring knowledge from the standpoint of the marginalized people in a platform that includes races, sexes, genders, and classes, South Asian standpoint feminists can offer multiple ways to address the epistemic decentering and violence. They can start with a focus on women and then look into genders and sexes and then interrogate the construction and production and justification of knowledge with an aim to locate and relocate the knower as a marginalized outsider from within, resisting to be branded as a passive receiver and refusing to let knowledge framed as power of the privileged. I'm interpreting the concept of uh, lived experience in relation to Beauvoir, Butler, Sixu, Irigaray, Bell Hooks, Gloria Anzaldúa, among others. But while addressing the lived experience of women and marginalized genders, I am siding with the standpoint theories, mostly because of my conviction, which is coming from Spivak's uh, strategic essentialism, that uh, in certain geopolitical locations, strategic essentialism as a force of collective resistance has a greater impact in addressing issues of discriminations and violence against women and minorities. Spivak's notion of strategic essentialism in context of identity of marginalized women subject delivers an ontology of collective identity of women. It is a short-term strategy to forge a sense of collective political identity that may help the marginalized secure, secure certain political ends. It can be a means of resistance, but not a goal. By questioning the privileging identity and by constantly looking into how truths are produced, Spivak says, feminists can question and challenge the normative framework of identity. We have to keep in mind that passivity is not an option. Neither is subjectivity. Subjectivity is a requirement because language does not speak without subjectivity. Victimization is not an option because it does not do any justice. It only reinforces the body has an object of desire, gaze, shame, and violence. What I mean here is that I, I refuse to use the term victim when it comes to you know, uh, rape and, and violence. Uh, uh, when, when translating the book by uh, Nilima Ibrahim, uh, Shafinil was telling, uh, talking about that. It's a book on, uh, it's a reportage on raped women during the war of 1971. And it is giving the story of, of the raped, you know, uh, uh, heroines or, or heroes or soldiers, I would say. So while, while doing that um, translation, I I, I learned to hate that word victim because as long as we use that word, you know, the rape victim, uh, sexual assault victim, every time we use the word, we are doing, you know, we are endangering the subject. We are making that person more passive, more objectified. So unknowingly, we are also contributing to the damage of that person's ontological being of that person's identity. So that is why I don't, I don't use uh, the word victim you know, in, in my discourse or in my uh, writing. So victimization is not an option because it does not do any justice. It only reinforces the body as an object of desire, gaze, shame, and violence. There should not be any fight for equal rights because such a demand reinforces 
fellow-centric power. The demand for equal rights presupposes inequality as an abstract truth. Of course, I'm thinking of post-structuralist and post-colonial framework of feminist definition of women's identity here. In this millennial postmodern world, no gender should be vowed as better or greater than the rest. Every gender and every sexed body must be deemed as already equal. Meanings are lived and experienced and carried through the body. The body of the text is intricately related to the body that knows and thinks and produces it. The task as a woman is not to write like a man or not write like a man. The task is to make language speak. The task is to make speaking heard. And the task is to make writing matter for yourselves and for the people of marginalized genders, sexes, races, classes, ethnicities, and culture. I didn't want to use any uh, literary text as my point of reference in this paper, but I'll present three legendary uh, women from the Indian subcontinent as my text. My first text is Kana. She was also known as Lilavati. The second one, uh, Nangeli, 19th century Kerala woman. And the third one is Chandravati, uh, 16th century Bengali poet uh, uh, from now Bangladesh. Uh, why Kona? For me, Kona, Kona is, a, what should I say? She stands as a metaphor of women's knowledge and as a, as a symbol of women's rejection of anthropocentric epistemology. Because she knew, she spoke and, and made her voice heard and made her language speak. And because she spoke against the fellowcentric social culture, they cut her tongue to silent, you know, and, and silence, uh, uh, to silence the voice of a speaking subject. The epistemic violence that was done to her is not a cautionary tale anymore. It is for me the beginning of the possibility of feminist epistemology from, from South Asian perspective. My second text is Nangeli. She died in, uh, in, in uh, 1803. And uh, she, for me, she's a myth of a woman's ontology of being. Again, I'm not doing any research on this. I'm throwing these questions so that you know students, uh, gen scholars, and gender studies they can uh, you know uh, look into it. And 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 I'm I'm going I'm using like different time frame: one ninth to twelfth century, nineteenth century, sixteenth century, because what when where you know their history does not belong to chronology. And, and um, I'm just um, signing off. Uh, Lucy Rigorai, uh, when she wrote her Speculum and, uh, of Other Women, she started with Freud and then she ended with Aristotle, just to prove the point that when it comes to oppression and objectifying a woman's body, history doesn't matter. It's been there, master narrative. It's been using back and forth, back and forth, 21st century, 20th century, doesn't matter. When you are objectified, when your violence is done against you, you don't consider yourself as you know a civilized historical being i mean if history was a means of civilization whatever things that are happening around me in this country you know you know black lives matter in other situations you know racial injustice it shouldn't have been happening right so history is you know uh, not uh, it's it's uh, as Foucault said it's teleological so that's why I have like three different women from three different areas or all areas for the matter. So let me go back to Nangeli. So she died in 1803. And as a story, her story is a myth of woman's ontology of being. A lower caste woman in the 19th century Kerala, Nangeli refused to comply with the breast tax. Uh, the breast, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, Kana uh, uh, Lilavati's uh, mound. It was in, uh, uh, excavated in, I think, 1960s. Kana and Mihir in, in West Bengal. And this is a painting of Nangeli done by this person, Morality. So well, I don't have any copyrights. I just uh, uh, found, I have the website. If you're interested, you can find. So a uh, lower caste woman in the 19th century Kerala, Nangeli refused to comply with the breast tax law, a custom that required women of lower caste to pay taxes if they wanted to cover their breasts. Nangeli refused to uncover her breast for the inspector and when she was asked to pay taxes for because she covered them, in, uh, instead of paying the taxes on a plantain leaf, Nangeli cut off her breasts, 
and put them on a banana leaf for, for the inspector as a tax. And she died uh, you know, uh, um, from excessive bleeding. And her husband jumped into her funeral pyre and died with her. And after that, 1803, after that, uh, the, the breast tax um, was uh, annulled. So Nangeli's act of annihilating her existence to prove her existence is an inquest. Her body became the text as it spoke the language of resistance and active involvement to initiate a change. My third text uh, is Chandrabhuti. Uh, she lived in like Shakespeare's time, 1550 to 1600, and in a village in Bangladesh, a place called Kishore Ganj. And she was the daughter of a great poet, Ujjha. And and then uh, and they, they, her father and others they were the part of the Mormon Shinha Gitika, you know that uh, that time so 16th century Bengali medieval literature, and she was a woman poet, and and I see her as a pioneer who felt the need for a uh, you know womanist uh, discourse just like uh, Sixu or or Ilgarai, that that partly partly uh, farm the the literature uh, feminine. She defied the androcentric structure of myths and legends by starting to rewrite the Ramayan from Sita's perspective. Chandrabhati died before completing her uh, uh, Ramayan, but that unfinished text was read and heard and sung by the women folks of Bengal for centuries. So uh, how do I end this talk, lecture presentation, this thing that explores the knowing, being, and writing of a woman? I want to speak like a woman without borders, La Frontera like New Mestiza, as Gloria Anzaldo has called it, acknowledging women's conflicting identities and embracing all conflicts using a speculum that offers many angles of vision. As a creative writer myself, I'll make my language speak for me and heard by you. So therefore, as my concluding remarks, I'll say these lasting words. So bear with me. Lasting words. Do not stay silent. Speak up and listen. Listen to your own voice and the voices of others voicing others' needs, suppressions, oppressions, violence. Do not sit idle, stand up and keep moving. Keep fighting, not for equal rights, but for the right to be you as you. Do not think yourself less equal because you are not. You are not subservient to them just because you are not a man. Say no, equal right is not for someone to give. Equal right is. Demand to be heard and acknowledged as an individual on your own right. Demand to speak for yourselves, for others, to others, about each other. Read, write, and speak to hear and to be heard. Do not mimic, for mimicking the masculine is not the answer. Do not echo, for echo has no identity of its own. Do not be content with one speech, one text, or one song. Speak and write in multitudes. You've been written about, talked about, and pushed away for many a time. You've been abused, assaulted, muted, mutilated, and murdered for many a time. Do not stay muted anymore. Be a writing, speaking subject, for subjectivity makes you possible. Do not shy away from language anymore, because not speaking up is not an option, because silence is never an option. Silence kills. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Faiza. And actually, I was listening and I was actually, you know, like uh, drawn into your speech. So, um, and, yeah. Thank you. So uh, there, there is a question uh, from Dr. Roshan uh, that mm -hmm. um, if women ask equal payment, they are demerited by their capacity. So what can we do to stop discriminatory actions? I think that one, because when you say it about the wage part, that comes mm -hmm. from her. Yeah, that's where, uh, oh, yeah, because Lucy Rigari talked about that. And she's saying that because the first thing is, you know, uh, the idea of uh, the idea of demanding equal rights. That is the first thing uh, when we still do that, we are actually accepting the fact that we are not equal yet, you know? So that means we are just like uh, using the term victimization. We, we, we are the ones constantly, we're putting ourselves in the cages instead of standing up and saying, no, I matter, I am, I am this. So this is like my sex body, my gender identity, 
or, or you know, that is, that is not how we uh, negotiate salaries. But it is a fact. It has, it has been a fact for, for what, centuries, right? So, uh, and again, uh, it, that is why I talked about the family standpoints theory. And that is why I talked about uh, Spivak's idea of, you know, the essentialism, strategic essentialism, that when you, you, you work with uh, your community, you speak up, you, you become actively involved, you know, so that laws can be changed, legal actions can be taken, you know, so that you're right as you, not as somebody that is seen as you, you know, that can, uh, you know, that can take away your rights. So it is like, um, I would say, conscious uh, involvement in, in, in different levels of, you know, legalization or legal, social, you know, policy making. So we have to be more involved into that so that, you know, uh, all these discriminations can be addressed. That is a good question, Roshan. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, this is actually, uh, I would like to ask from you, like, uh, uh, margin, as you were talking about marginalized people, so um, most of the scholars, they uh, actually, uh, when they talk about the marginalized people, um, then comes about the subaltern people, and also comes that uh, Spivak's a uh, very famous uh, paper, Can We Subaltern Speak? So once actually I met her and I asked her that can just uh, remove that subaltern people, can we women speak yet? And she said that no. So uh, this is my question to you that do you think that women, no matter from which class she is, I mean, woman I'm talking about, isn't she marginalized in every class? everywhere this is the first question and also that when you um, uh, we are talking about the khana and also chandravati so i i was thinking of khana that her voice was stopped by her in laws and her society and also chandravati her marriage her uh, literature her transmission was not that much recognized her time when other uh, male uh, writers or male poets uh, writings uh, were much recognized so uh, and that kind of suppression we the creative writers still having we are still having that kind of suppression like in male dominated male writers dominated world you know so um, do you think that that actually for women writer the recognition okay from in uh, uh, from the readers or that that is much actually influenced by the male writers or male scholars that uh, do you think so actually the first question is women from which no matter from which class she or they are marginalized everywhere and the second one is that women writing it's not still recognized do you agree with that of course, I mean, um, um, two things speak uh, for the first thing I'll say that uh, uh, speak from the margin, you know, margin is important. I mean, think in, 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 in context of the, the rhetorical, you know, uh, uh, symbiosis, when you read a book, our comments, where do we write those on the margin, right? We, uh, we, we have our important ideas. We write them on the margin of a book. So I always, uh, you know, when I teach a gender class, I always make jokes about that, that it is the margin that you read. Because if you borrow my book, you are looking for my, my understanding. And I'm always standing on the margin, but I'm giving my voice from the margin. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, staying there, uh, being on the margin, but make yourself heard. I mean, the way that Irigo Rai said that make language, you know, speak. So make language matter. And then there should be, you know, the margin, the non-margin, who gives, who divides, who creates the margin, you know. So that is one thing. So uh, active, conscious uh, involvement is needed. That is uh, for the first thing. So, yes, I, I agree with Spivak. Uh, you know that. And uh, it is uh, women non-binary, fluid, you know, uh, non-normative people cannot speak. They can speak, but they are not heard. So that is where language should become. 
the 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 instrument you know when Audre Lord said when you know the master's tool cannot dismantle the master's you know house that means you, you have to create a new tool you create a new uh, narrative that is not that doesn't have this idea of master slave you know binary or ideology attached the second question where you said that women's writing is not recognized is not recognized by whom so the sentence is a passive sentence. No one needs to recognize me. I don't write to be recognized by, by, uh, by the phallogocentric, endocentric ideology, or, or you know that is sitting there and then reading my text and then underlining them and saying that hey, this is not the logic. This doesn't follow this rule, that rule. You know, create your own rule. Language belongs to everyone. You know, so. Uh, so it is. It is a movement that needs to start. The movement has started. It is, you know, this time your generation, new generation, they're writing. New rules are being uh, set and then broken. So this uh, new movement, you know, has started. Consciousness has its own movement to run. This this conference is a good example of it. People from all over the places. They're they're here. They're speaking. They're hearing each other, you know. So that is how things get uh, get get recognized on its own terms. I don't know if I answered your questions, but those are good questions, problematic questions. <laughs> no, it, it's okay. No, actually, um, yeah, it's it's fine, completely fine. So I'd like to ask uh, if anyone want to say something, if you want to ask, or if you want to uh, talk about the paper. Uh, is there anyone? Please welcome. Is there anyone? Shubha, you want to say something? I just want to compliment ma'am uh, for a wonderful presentation. <laughs> and it's such a delight to uh, listen to your uh, words, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shubra. Thank you so much. I feel blessed. So, um, thank you so much, Dr. Pfizer. And um, this is really our immense pleasure that you uh, <laughs> came here and you gave your speech. And uh, I've, and actually, we all the organizers and co-organizers, we are really happy to have you here. Thank you so much, and hope no. we will uh, find and uh, we'll have you next again. So. <laughs> thank you, thank you for having me, and it was it's a, it's a wonderful uh, uh, um, setup, and I got to listen to uh, good uh, presenters, good ideas, and I'll listen some more tomorrow because now it's like 2 30 in the morning at my end so yeah so i'm sorry if I'm, I'm not here for the rest of the session but i'll catch up with you guys tomorrow and feel free to uh you know talk to me email me keep in touch if you have questions and if you want to get more confused with my you know ranting and ramblings i'm good at doing those <laughs> so yeah it was it was fun being here so thank you for having me so uh good day everyone much and yeah we are really sorry that you had to present this one at that oh, no, no, that's, no, that's okay that's okay I, i'm a night owl so it's good <laughs> good so you guys have a wonderful rest of the presentation uh, conference today so bye thank now. you and good night good night uh good day okay bye thank you